This is the Asia Trade. I'm Sherian in Tokyo. I'm Heidi Stradwatts in Sydney, where the market has just opened. The top story is this hour. It is a cautious open ahead after China's weekend finance ministry briefing left investors wanting more. Data showing deflation becoming more entrenched, adding to worries over the world's number two economy. U.S. bank earnings begin rolling in. J.P. Morgan reporting a surprise net interest income gain. Huawei's Fargo profit tops estimates on a surge in investment banking fees. And Taiwan's government tells Bloomberg that TSMC is planning more European factories with a focus on AI. We'll be hearing from the science minister, Wu Chengwen. We have a couple of markets crossed across Asia, close across Asia today, including here in Japan and also in Thailand. We'll be watching the Japanese yen holding at around the 149 level against the U.S. dollar. But it's really going to be about what's happening in China, right? The market reaction that we could potentially see from the lack of any details when it comes to the finance ministry's uh, stimulus to come. We also saw some more deflationary pressures out of China, not to mention the, we are getting trade numbers out of the Chinese economy on Monday as well. We're seeing the offshore yuan now weaken against the U.S. dollar by about a quarter percent. But we have seen really incredible strength on the U.S. dollar, right? Take a look at how U.S. futures are coming online. The greenback rose for the past two weeks already. The U.S. is away on holidays on this Monday, so we're not expecting a lot of big moves in global markets right now. But when it comes to really digesting what we saw in the beginning of the earnings season in the U.S. The S&P 500 is already at a 45th record high this year, and a big part of that uh, jump on Friday came from banks. KBW Bank Index now at the highest level since 2022. Heidi, really, it was J.P. Morgan, Wells Fargo showing how the U.S. consumer is still strong and resilient. What a different picture from what we're seeing in China. Yeah, and you know, we thought that maybe it was a different picture, but of course we're seeing some of the wavering in terms of what investors want from China's highly anticipated finance ministry briefing over the weekend, lacking that firepower equity that investors had hoped for. Beijing is promising more aid for the slumping property sector, indebted local governments as well, but economists are not convinced that it's enough to defeat deflation. Let's bring our China correspondent Min Ming Lo in Hong Kong. So what was announced and, and how did it sort of you know, I guess, adjust expectations from this market. Yeah, well, we didn't get any splashy headline number in terms of the size of the fiscal stimulus, but I would say that that is still on the table, given that, remember I mentioned earlier that any revision to the budget deficit, as well as any new issuance of bonds above this year's quarter, have to be approved by the legislature. So we could still hear that after the National People's Congress Standing Committee meets in late October. But the Ministry of Finance did give us a hint of uh, measures to come, and that includes a one-off bond quota to swap hidden debt of local governments. And this is key because we know sp fiscal spending has been lagging behind, especially in the first eight months of the year. Spending has shrunk by 3%. So this would take the pressure of local governments and to get them to spend again and invest in the economy again. The other key thing that the government is doing is to issue special sovereign bonds to help inject capital into the big banks, easing off those margin pressures, especially after the PBOC called for cuts to mortgage rates and also slashed key policy rates. Uh, also, special local government bonds is now going to be allowed to be used for buying up unsold homes as well as idle land parcel. Again, something to accelerate the home buyback program as well um, and doubling the quota for college student subsidies. Now, I think what markets are really disappointed by is the lack of policy that are directly targeted at boosting consumption. Most of these measures are targeted. Uh, targeting tackling local government debt uh, and um, yeah and other areas of the economy. So that lack of uh, stimulus for consumption side policy that is the big disappointment here. <coughs> Yeah, at a time when we already saw the data just showing us those deflationary problems persist in the Chinese economy, what are we expecting to be the reaction not only from that disappointment but for the broader markets as well? Yeah, I mean, over the weekend, we got that inflation data really disappointing as well, missing expectations when it comes to both CPI and PPI. The inflation, consumer price inflation came, came in at 0.4%. And that's even after vegetable prices increased because of bad weather, the typhoons that we've been seeing. And if you strip away the energy and food prices and look at core inflation, that is only 0.1%, just hovering above zero, the weakest print that we have seen since, I believe, February of 
of 2021 and produces price index as well in negative territory for 24 straight months. And so we're seeing this worsening of the deflationary spiral, not just showing up in the prices, uh, but also in wages as well. New hiring wages in third quarter also down by 0.6%. And that is, I guess, more evidence that fiscal stimulus from the government is increasingly important. And I guess patience is needed from equity investors as we wait for the actual size of the stimulus. The Ministry of Finance did give us some forward guidance saying that there is still relatively large room to increase fiscal deficit. Well, Rex Chan, a correspondent with Min Lo, that. Let's bring in Carlos Casanova, who's a senior Asia economist at UBP, and he joins us now from Hong Kong. And so as you outlined in your sort of initial reaction, we weren't really expecting solid figures, despite what investors might have had on their wish list. Does this imply that we're not going to get sizable firepower, or should we kind of just wait and see as the details emerge? That's correct. Um, we were not expecting to see the figures um, over the weekend because, of course, those have to be approved by Congress, and the fiscal deficit target for 2025 is only approved at the National People's Congress annual meeting in March. So investors um, definitely have to be a lot more patient when it comes to the size of the fiscal stimulus package. Um, I think we will get um, some numbers uh, possibly before the end of the month. Um, but um, I think the conversation that investors are having here is whether this is a whatever it takes moment for China or whether we are looking at an ongoing reflation. Um, and I think that from the wording um, coming out of the finance minister, yes, uh, at face value, they said that they have a lot of room to increase the fiscal deficit uh, ceiling. They have um, you know, the ability to, to, to issue more bonds. But when he outlined the sort of uh, tools and what they are aiming to achieve with the um, bank recapitalization program and the debt swap program for um, local governments, it is clear that they are just uh, tackling some of the structural issues. They are not really looking to massively inject. Um, so it does not constitute a whatever it takes moment, um, in my opinion. Yeah, and, and to that point, some of those structural issues have been a long time building in terms of systemic risk, right? So do you think that there is still a willingness to allow some of those weaknesses to play out? Because we, we know that the long-term normal is, is not to be able to sustain the type of growth that China's seen over the past few decades. Mm. Absolutely. That's a very good question. Um, some of the structural issues uh, are not going to be resolved with uh, one, two or three trillion uh, Chinese yuan in bond issuance. Um, the value of outstanding local government finance vehicle debt alone is uh, multiple trillions higher than that, and not to mention the value of unsold uh, um, properties in China. So really for a whatever it takes moment it would have to be you know upwards of 10 trillion um, and that's not going to happen so what we are seeing really um, is that they are looking to inject some cash to prevent uh, growth from stalling massively so the goal here is to have enough growth to facilitate structural reforms those reforms still need to pan out this that, that process still needs to happen um, but they are not looking to reflate the economy back to you know, nominal GDP around 2%, uh, 10%, sorry, which is what investors um, were used to coming out of China in the 2000s. So that's not going to happen again. Um, this is an ongoing deceleration, and they are looking to smooth out the process so that they can get on with structural reforms. So what are you expecting to see in the barrage of Chinese data that we get this week? Trade, GDP, also activity, of course, a bit backwards looking, given that all of these numbers will be before Beijing's pivot in late September. But what will it tell us about where Beijing goes from here, especially when it comes to its 5 percent growth target for the year? Correct. Well, the measures are backward looking. And of course, they have done a policy pivot of sorts. Um, so we are expecting the data to come in weak. Um, specifically, um, the GDP number, uh, we are expecting a deceleration to around 4.3%, possibly a little bit higher than that. Um, but it, it will make it more challenging for China to achieve 5% growth this year if they only have one remaining quarter to catch up. Now, remember that they were in a very similar situation um, towards the end of last year, and they were able to do a combination of policy stimulus and uh, PBOC liquidity to try to uh, reach that GDP target by the end of the year. So what I expect to see is a, slightly, a slight pickup in momentum in the fourth quarter, but overall uh, potential GDP miss by 0.1 or 0.2 percentage uh, points uh, in 2024. Looking into 2025, I think it depends on the size of that fiscal stimulus package.
where China goes, many of its trading peers follow, right? What do you expect to be the implications for other Asian economies if we do not see that firepower coming from the stimulus and fiscal side of things? I think it's a double-edged sword, to be quite fair. Um, when we have subdued demand from China, we see uh, fewer upside risks on commodity prices, um, specifically oil, um, and we see deflationary pressures because, of course, uh, China is exporting some of that excess capacity. We saw that PPI number coming in more negative than expected, than minus 2.8 percent. Um, so that's going to uh, be a tailwind for Asian economies in terms of um, them being able to deliver on their easing cycle. So that is the silver lining. I think it's going to uh, mean that uh, other economies in Asia will be in a good position to do uh, more rate cuts than the Fed in 2025. On the other hand, uh, uh, countries that are exposed to China in terms of supply chains or final demand, those countries are inevitably going to feel uh, a bit of uh, weakness coming out of China also next year as they try to navigate this structural problem. We do get Singapore GDP and the Monetary Authority of Singapore also coming out later today uh, with their decision when it comes to their policies. Uh, what do you see in economies like Singapore when it comes to the fact that they are so trade exposed, so externally reliant, smaller economies? That's a very good question because trade has been a tailwind of sorts also for China in the first half of this year. Now, I am not sure if we are already going to see it in the, in the sort of backward-looking data from last month, but we do expect that uh, the narrative around uh, soft landing in the U.S. Uh, is going to entail some weakness on the trade front. Um, so China, of, of course, will not have that tailwind over the coming months, but uh, smaller export-oriented economies like Singapore, like Taiwan, um, are going to definitely incur a deceleration in economic activity on the back of slower exports in the coming months uh, because we are going to see weaker global demand uh, with the slowing down of the U.S. economy. So definitely something also to keep uh, an eye out. If we do see that weaker export number coming out of China this week, then that's going to add fuel to the fire when it comes to investors feeling bearish about uh, the Chinese economy. Carlos Casanova, good to have you back. Senior Asia economist at UBP. And also coming up on the Asia trade, we speak to the Global Maritime Forum about supply chains and the impact of the Middle East conflict. Pepperstone Group will be with us too to explain why the lack of immediate clarity on China's efforts to reflate the economy is unlikely to be taken well by markets. Plus, Dragon Capital, one of Vietnam's largest fund managers, will be joining us later. This is Bloomberg. China's finance ministry is promising more support for the property sector and hinted at greater government borrowing to shore up the economy. But the briefing did not produce a headline dollar figure for fresh fiscal stimulus. Gulf Ford Reynolds leads our markets live coverage in Asia and joins us now. So, Gulf, we weren't expecting a dollar number or a yuan number on that, right? So, you know, talk well, to us about that. Well, we might not that. have been. <laughs> but, uh, but the difficulty is that a lot of... Th there was plenty of chatter that there would be, you know, some sort of concrete number. Uh, and a lot of investors had said, you know, they're expecting two trillion yuan or more of, of stimulus at least. Now, the concern always was that you wouldn't get that number because whatever the minister m might say about what's coming, uh, you know, if it's going to be in addition to what's already in the budget, that has to be signed off on by the legislature, by the, more, the senior body that's going to meet probably <laughs> later this month. It normally meets late October, early November. So you are always going to be left hanging, waiting for them to approve it. Now we're sort of left hanging, waiting for them to decide on a potential budget boost. And if they do deliver one, which they did you know, last year, then you know, that would help. But again, it's it's this, uh, to some extent, perhaps um, it's unfortunate for investors that the PBOC head was so you know, specific and delivered so much, along with some of the other things that came around his presser, to really kick things off. Because 
that, that's kind of the exception that proves the rule when it comes to the way China operates. You get you know, lots of talk about what they are going to do, but the details are going to come later because you know, despite the, the theme that China is uh, you know, somewhat authoritarian in its, uh, as a regime, it, it's a very big country with a very complicated uh, bunch of mechanisms for running its, its economy. So this is you know, like turning around three super tankers at once. <laughs> <laughs> that is sort of what happened last year with the NPC, right, where they announced more government bonds. But at the same time, looking ahead, we have so much sort of backward-looking Chinese data coming up. We have an ECB rate decision. Of course, we have uh, the U.S. earnings season also kicking off. Garf, what will you be really focused on as we move through the week? Well, I, I am still going to be focused on China, you, you know, to a large degree. And in a lot of ways... On, on how investors deal with the serial disappointments, how they adjust their, you know, their sites, as it were. We had an extraordinary 27% you know, jump in the space of five days for the CSI 300. That's the most ever in that sort of space, 10 percentage points greater than any previous five-day jump. It's also very unusual. Uh, the last time the S&P 500 had that kind of jump was uh, in 1932, so that was a while ago. Uh, so after that, you're always likely to get a slowing in the pace going forward. I actually think there's the potential that you will get Chinese gains from here, but they're going to disappoint anybody who's thinking they have the potential to sort of repeat, maybe not quite so quickly, but you know, those big gains. And the question is going to be, you know, can China stop underperforming, which it has done on a serial basis over you know, the last three, four years? Kafu Reynolds, who leads the Markets Live coverage for us here in Asia. And, of course, we have been watching uh, the other story. As, as so much focus has remained, really, on China. Uh, it's a big earnings week this week, of course, when it comes to the big banks. Uh, Goldman City, Bank of America, Morgan Stanley, we've had sort of a couple of already. But these are sort of the expectations that we have going into this week, particularly when it comes to uh, how they gauge up to the Fed easing expectations there as well, right? Because we do have uh, a number of these likely to flag rising revenue pressures in their reports, uh, along with smaller regional counterparts we're expecting to hear from as well, start to kind of reckon with what happens with this easing cycle. The net interest income is coming under pressure as the easing cycle begins, of course, Sherry. Uh, the sort of uh, some of the other earnings that we're watching will come into play as well, but certainly it will be about the big bank city, for example, seeing net revenue likely to dip by 1.4 per cent. We're expecting Bank of America to fall for a fourth straight quarter, slipping 15 per cent for earnings there. Goldman's probably actually fared the worst out of all its peers in terms of trading performance. We're also likely to see that $400 million charge from uh, the shrinking of the consumer business, Sherry. So it was really interesting to see the banks outperformed in the Friday session, right? The KBW Bank Index at the highest level since 2022. And it all of this given the fact that you mentioned the pressure on really net interest income, but JP Morgan actually surprising to the upside for that metric, not to mention that they actually raised their forecast for their key revenue source. Also, we actually saw a pickup in deal making activity with rates coming down. Now, Wells Fargo uh, did see net interest income slumping, but they're still expecting that drop to be less steep in the last quarter. In fact, we heard from the Wells Fargo CFO, Michael Santo Massimo telling us that they're expecting deposits to drive near-term performance. Rates are still quite high on a relative basis over the, from the last, few years, the last few years, and so you are still seeing repricing happen on the asset side. Um, but in the near term, what really drive what really drive where we end up over the next couple quarters is the deposit side, and we've seen some good uh, trends there or now over the last couple quarters, where you've seen this this cash sorting and the mixed different mix changes really moderate. Uh, it's, it was the slowest uh, quarter where you know so far since uh, over the last couple years you know for that uh, in the portfolio. Um, and, and we've been able to adjust pricing as, uh, just as we thought we would as the rates came down. So that'll be the, that'll be the factor that really drives near-term performance.
So, uh, Mike, it's good to chat with you. Uh, to that point, then, does that mean that the move into higher yielding, say, CDs or money market funds, et cetera, like, that's definitely done as rates cuts come down? Well, I wouldn't say it's, it's necessarily done, but, but I think we saw the lowest, lowest pace of migration since uh, rates started increasing, uh, Alex. And so I think you know, that's a good trend. And I think eventually what you, do, what you see generally or expect to see generally is that you know, what's left in checking accounts ends up being operating cash for a lot of people. So a lot of that shifting into other, other uh, alternatives has happened already. Yeah, my high yield savings account already coming down there. All right, uh, let's get to the loan part of your portfolio. When do you think you see a really big uptick in loan growth? What's going to be that catalyst? Yeah, it's really hard to say exactly, right? And, and I think when you look at what's, what we're hearing from clients and what you're seeing, you know, rates coming down, helpful, right? Because borrowing costs come down. I think there's still some uncertainty related to the election that's coming up. And then I think people want to see this base case kind of soft landing economic scenario play out a little bit longer. And then I think a combination of those things will start to build confidence. Um, and then I think you may start to see people either build inventories or, or make additional capital expenditures that, they, that they've been holding off on now for a little bit. But I don't think it's just one thing. I think you really need to see a you know, confluence of these things come together. And so it could take a little bit of time. Uh, for that to really materialize uh, in borrowing. With regards to that client activity, Mike, and, and the election, and the idea that once we get past that, maybe we see more activity, is that irrespective of who wins, or are they trying to hedge their bets? Well, you know, I think, I think uh, you know, what people don't like is uncertainty, Romain. And, and so I think once there's some certainty of the path, um, and you, you, know, you feel like that economic you know, outlook is going to play out the way they think, I think those things are going to what, what really matter. Uh, and then assuming rates continue to come down and reduce borrowing costs. So I, I really do think it's going to be a combination of all those things, but it's the, it's, the, it's the uncertainty part that I think causes people to hold off. Las Vegas CFO Mike Santa Massimo there speaking with Bloomberg's Alex Steele and Romain Bostic. More ahead on the Asia trade, this is Bloomberg. The U.S. is sending an advanced missile defense system, including troops, to Israel. In response, Iran's foreign minister says Tehran has no red lines in defending itself from threats and that the U.S. is putting lives of its troops at risk. Bloomberg's Michael Heath joins us now for more. So what are we seeing in terms of, I guess, this next step of strategy? Yeah, well, I mean, the, the U.S. deployment, I guess, is, is really just to bolster Israel's air defences. I mean, um, some of Iran's la the missiles and projectiles from Iran's last attack uh, did get through. Um, so I guess this is just trying to shore that up in terms of, of the U.S. sending troops there. Um, but the Iranian comment about no red lines, too, is kind of interesting because there's been concerns. I mean, this is sort of sort of in the background um, in various reports that some of the Gulf monarchies are a little bit worried that Iran might retaliate by hitting them as well. Um, Iran's already said anyone who assists Israel and if it chooses to strike will, will you know, become a target. But there's just worries that they could, they could come into the firing line as well there. So, Mike, uh, what can we expect in terms of the impact, uh, given that we continue to wait for any sort of actual retaliation coming from Israel, as we are also seeing Hezbollah uh, continue their attacks? Yeah, Sherry, it's a real war of nerves at the moment, um, I mean, in terms of Israel and Iran and, and the whole region there. Uh, with Hezbollah, there's still um, the fighting is still fairly fairly um, significant that's been going on there. Uh, there was a, a projectile that was fired by Hezbollah that's that hit south of Haifa in, in Israel, and uh, it didn't. The alarms weren't sent off there, which would normally send people to bomb shelters and this sort of thing. Uh, so four soldiers were killed and, and um, a few dozen people were injured there as well. So uh, the, the initial report is that the Israelis had tracked this drone and then it had gone off the radar. Um, one of the theories is that it had gone very low to the ground. So it came off the radar, and so they, did, they thought that it had crashed. And in fact, when, it, when it, it struck the target, but again, this sort of comes back to what I was talking about with Hardy. This is sort of the U.S. trying to shore up uh, Israel's defences there, um, because you know the reports that are, that are just generally circulating at the moment is the expectation is that Israel would target potentially. Um, 
Iran's military and potentially energy infrastructure. The, the nuclear option seems to be off the table, which is, um, which is obviously good news in terms of the, the, the conflict spreading. Um, the logic there is really that, that uh, Iran's nuclear facilities are very dispersed, and even if Israel went in with an all-out attack, it would just uh, delay rather than, you know, that rather than put an end to its nuclear ambitions. So there, there's not a lot of military logic there. So it looks like it would be sort of military, potentially energy infrastructure that would be looked at. And then the US is coming in to sort of bolster the other side of it. Um, but yeah, the, the Hezbollah operation still, uh, the operation in, in southern Lebanon still continues. Um, Israel found a, a, a Hezbollah operative who was buried quite deep in a tunnel. Um, the idea being that he, and he had food and supplies there. The idea being that these sort of guys can pop up behind soldiers and uh, an ambush. And this is one of the great, great dangers of a, a ground operation. Bloomberg's Michael Heath there with the latest on the rising tensions in the Middle East. As we continue to watch, of course, the risk, the geopolitical tensions posed on global trade. The WTO says global goods trade in 2025 will grow less than initially forecast as rising instability weighs on economic activity and threatens to disrupt shipping. More than 200 industry leaders will gather in Tokyo this week for the Global Maritime Forum, tackling issues including trade, decarbonization and the well-being of seafarers. Johanna Christensen is the co-founder and CEO of the Global Maritime Forum. Johanna, great to have you here in Tokyo. What are your members telling you right now about the risks in geopolitics and different parts of the world? Uh, well, certainly it's a sector that's always been affected by uh, different uh, events around the world. And in prior years, we've seen different types of disruptions take place. And so it's something that the maritime industry and the leaders that are attending here this week are really used to having to tackle. So it adds a new level of uncertainty, certainly some new risks, but it's, it's nevertheless something that the sector is used to. Does this feel any different from past times, especially when you have escalation between the Israel and the Iran and the potential fears about the Strait of Hormuz? Uh, I mean, absolutely, from the, from the point of view that, of course, um, uh, companies that operate in that region, which is to say most shipping companies, uh, really have to make uh, very difficult choices about where, uh, when and where to operate their ships and, uh, and have to make some difficult choices in that regard. What yeah. sort of choices? Well, about whether to, uh, to uh, try to secure passage or to divert uh, to alternate routes, which many are choosing to do. At a time, of course, when we're also worried about the global economy, it seems at least we're getting some resilient data from the U.S., but are we seeing some weak points across your members in some of the routes that they're traveling, especially when it comes to increasing trade around the world? Um, Generally speaking, we see that, uh, and there's been an evolution over, over past years, that it, it c trade continues to grow. Um, and in terms of how to, uh, it, it's, a, it's a little, um, um, there's a, for shipping, there's a silver lining from the point of view that uh, longer trade routes, uh, so the divergence around uh, Africa, for example, um, adds actually to the demand for shipping. So actually it has, a, it has a, a negative impact in the world, typically have a positive impact for shipping, which is ironic to be totally honest. Mm. Johanna, how much uh, are you and the, the sort of membership going to be focusing on the growing geopolitical risk, right? Depending on what happens with the US election in November, obviously, so, uh, so many of the risks that are arising across the Middle East. Is that sort of one of the top focuses at this forum? Um, actually, our focus is primarily on longer term issues. And while I don't want to negate that, uh, that some of these shorter term um, challenges are going to have long term impacts as well or can have long term impacts as well, um, whether it be uh, political or, or in terms of the economy, um, our focus is primarily on long term issues. So anything that extends into a 5, 10, 15 year hor horizon and where we provide an opportunity for executives to come together and really think about the long term challenges that they're facing, not only the near-term ones, on which I think they spend most of their their day-to-day -day, uh, working hours. Yeah, and at long term, obviously, climate is front and centre, right? What are the conversations that are taking place in terms of mitigation of climate risk? Yeah, so... Um, 
In terms of addressing uh, shipping's climate impacts, uh, the sector is really fa facing a wholesale transformation over the next uh, 20 to 25 years, and where it's going to, the sector needs to transition from uh, effectively running almost entirely on, on fossil fuels um, to a, a future where it's going to be operating using um, uh, zero emission energy sources as its primary energy source. And that means that a, a whole new set of ships, a whole new set of fuel infrastructure, a whole new uh, set of uh, supporting functions needs to be developed in order to support that transition. And that's, uh, of course, quite difficult, as it is in many other sectors and in shipping as well. Um, what we see is that uh, there is a very exciting uh, uh, action amongst first movers that are taking the first steps, but a lot still needs to happen uh, in order to bridge from where we are today to the future, the zero emission future that we, that we hope to see. Given that we continue to see really extreme weather around the world, we have seen back-to-back -back hurricanes in southern U.S. as well. Um, are you seeing increased focus on the need for the shipping industry to get on board with some of the more aggressive measures when it comes to dealing with climate change? Um, the, the development in the shipping sector has been underway for some years. Um, the uh, uh, shipping sector's international regulator, re regulator, the International Maritime Organization, has set quite ambitious targets even just some few years ago, and and that means that the sector has been working on this. So while uh, big weather events obviously play an important role, it's it's a, transfer, uh, a transformational journey that the sector has been on for some years. Johanna, good to have you with us. Johanna Christensen, co-founder and CEO of the Global Maritime Forum. They have their annual summit here in Tokyo this week. We have more ahead on the Asia trade. This is Bloomberg. The world's biggest shipmaker, TSMC, could be looking at further expanding its facilities in Europe. That's according to Taiwan's tech minister, although TSMC has told us it has no new investment plans currently. Let's bring our tech reporter, Annabelle Jewellers. So what are we hearing? Well, it was actually a really interesting interview that we had with Minister Wu, and he was talking about just the general importance that TSMC, of course, as you said, it's the world's biggest chip maker, and, and how closely aligned the government is with it to try and help it maintain that competitive edge. So we know TSMC has already broken ground on new facilities in Dresden in Germany, but that's really about producing automotive chips, and they're not the most advanced of semiconductors. So it's really that question of where would they look to, to push uh, their most advanced technology outside of Taiwan and when would that happen as well? We heard about this in the interview. Take a listen. Well, I, I think uh, TSMC will not expand so quickly. However, uh, exploring the market to determine what is next for, for them to invest, I mean the next fab. Uh, the, the main focus of the, of the market for TSMC it's very important. When they, when, when they build this, they have started the construction of the first fab in Dresden. They are already planning the next few fabs in the future for different mar market sectors as well. But of, of course, the most important would be the AI market. Whether they will stay in Dresden or move to, I mean, migrate, distribute to other parts of the European Union, it's up to their evaluation of, of the market expansion. And whenever they do, our government will help them to establish joint uh, research collaboration for them to keep, uh, keep continue to develop new technologies. Which places exactly do you think are the most likely contenders? I know that there are so many countries in the world that are inviting TSMC to invest in their countries. And of course, TSMC may be considering, I, I'm, I'm not sure, they may be considering, uh, maybe investigating possibilities in other countries. However, I, I understand that the factors that I mentioned in, in the beginning, if they pick a location to invest, it's, very, it, it's got to be very similar to the model that we have established in the science park, the academia and the government support. 
and, and, and then uh, the market, the, the me. When you say that you're talking with, with governments abroad and giving advice around science parks, that's what you're really referring to. You're, you're saying this is how we've done it in Taiwan and right. we recommend that you do X, right. Y, Z to attract businesses here. Right, it's not just to invite in a company over there, it's an ecosystem. If there's no ecosystem, TSMC will not survive. Just with one fact, it's, it's impossible. And when you go to those governments that you talk to, do you also have a list ready of companies that are prepared to move? Yes. How long is that list? <laughs> well, it, it can be long, it can be short. If it's short, we can invite local companies, as I mentioned. In, in this three countries, in, in the US, in Japan, in Dresden, in, in Germany, used to be very strong in semiconductor with the three countries, used to be. So it's easy for them to re-establish the missing parts of the list. Well, Minister Wu didn't specify any timeline for TSMC's possible expansion across Europe or to other sites. And as well, we should point out that we did actually reach out to TSMC, of course, for a response here. And TSMC said that they would just focus on their current investment plans and not having anything slated just yet. But still, it, it is that big focus, of course, on where TSMC could possibly go next, especially uh, when you think about the, the, the sort of outlook that we see for semiconductor growth generally. And that will be one of the things that we watch out for in the earnings call this week. Uh, the, the model, though, that they're looking at of these science parks, that was something that was really clear in the interview with Minister Wu, talking about the importance of them and how they've really underpinned the success that Taiwan has seen in this industry. And so the, the Czech Republic really emerging as perhaps a key winner here or an early winner, uh, given the proximity to that site in Dresden, and also that uh, Taipei and Prague have deepened their partnership in recent years. Uh, Prague doesn't have a very extensive trading relationship with China. Perhaps it can afford to be a little bit more outspoken in this area, uh, have these sorts of talks with Taiwan. But yes, a, a really great interview that we had with Minister Wu and certainly many, many insights, not just on this, but also the outlook for the US election and what that means for Taiwan's semiconductor ecosystem as well. Tech report out of all jewelers. Joel is here. Watch us live and catch up on our past interviews on our interactive TV function. That's at TV Go. You can also dive into any of the security or the Bloomberg functions that we talk about. Plus, join in on the conversation by sending us instant messages during our shows. It is for Bloomberg subscribers only. Do check it out. It's at TV Go. This is Bloomberg. This is the Asia Trade. These are the latest from the corporate front. Hong Kong's biggest real estate developer, Sung Hong Kai Properties, says it sold all 238 units at its Cullinan and Sky project. Units in the development in Hong Kong's Kai Tak district sold for an average of more than 2,900 US dollars per square foot. The market is keenly watching apartment sales in Hong Kong for signs rate cuts might help ease the city's property slump. The collective of charities that indirectly controls India's $165 billion Tata Group has appointed Noel Tata at its, as its new chairman. Tata Trust says the decision was unanimous and effective immediately. 67-year-old Noel is the half-brother of former chair Ratan Tata, who died last week. He currently heads the group's fast fashion retailer Trent and aircon maker Voltas. Chinese EV maker BYD is working on its strategy to woo European buyers. Executive Vice President Stella Lee told the newspaper the company may initially offer electric vehicles in Germany for about $27,000 to $32,000. The plan comes after the EU this month voted to impose tariffs of as much as 45% on EVs from China. Well, SpaceX Sherry has achieved a new milestone, catching the giant Starship booster with mechanical arms, allowing it, for to, it to be reused for future flights. It is a crucial step on the road to full reusability of the rocket, dramatically reducing the cost of space exploration. Bloomberg's Paul Allen joins us now. So I guess put into context for us, you know, how big a stride this was. Well, this is huge. And I remember when Elon Musk first proposed the idea of catching this booster with those mechanical arms that he calls the chopsticks, everybody thought he was crazy. But then 
everybody thought landing a Falcon 9 boosters on drone ships at sea was crazy, and now it happens so often we don't even think about it. But if we take a look at these pictures, I mean, that booster, it's 71 meters high, it's 9 meters wide, it's the size of a small building. Uh, one SpaceX employee called this magic, uh, Elon Musk said it's science fiction. Uh, without the fiction part. But this is the next generation after Falcon 9. It's capable of carrying so much more. 150,000 kilos per launch, that's six times as much as the Falcon 9. 10 million per flight. The Falcon 9 flight right now is about 67 million. So getting to orbit is going to be so much cheaper, a lot more efficient, and the whole stack will eventually be reusable. They've been developing the Starship very quickly, so what are we looking forward to next? Well, they sure have. It was just 18 months ago that we were sitting here watching the first launch, which exploded after three minutes, and yet here we are at this stage now. So the next step is going to be recovering that top stage of the rockets. Uh, today that that splashed down in the middle of the ocean, but stage two, that gets caught by the chopsticks as well and then restacked. Okay. After that, we can expect to see a huge ramp up in the Starlink satellite deployment, uh, launches perhaps daily even multiple times per day is being proposed. And then beyond that, SpaceX has contracts with NASA to land astronauts back on the moon. Uh, the ultimate goal, though, to get enough payload to Mars to build a colony. Now, the next Mars launch window opens in 2026. At the rate we're going here, you wouldn't rule out seeing some sort of mission there in a couple of years' time. And Bugs Paul Allen there with the latest on SpaceX. Taking a look at what we're watching when it comes to Aussie assets, and I suppose really the most interesting sort of aspect of this is uh, how we're seeing that negativity to the disappointment in China, the sort of no solid details on fiscal stimulus story being expressed through some of these uh, China proxies. Of course, front and centre is the Aussie dollar. We're seeing that a little bit softer, 67.28 there. It's looking to potentially uh, take a closer look at that visit below 67 cents. Traders are really going through that underway. China briefing reaction along with worsening deflationary problems and the idea of uh, uh, sort of softening price, price pressures being now entrenched there. Uh, downside risks looking very much uh, at, at the likelihood when it comes to the Aussie as well. Long exposure running at the highest for more than three years. We're also seeing a little bit of upside there when it comes to trading in Australian stocks and that's really being led uh, by some of the leadership in miners interestingly despite the disappointment over China and some of those banks tracking gains in the U.S. as well. Taking a look at the rest of uh, the outlook when it comes to what we're seeing with trading in FX, we did have the dollar looking at that second week of gains there and the continued underperformance of the yen being that story as well. You're seeing dollar China, another way that we can look at uh, the market's sort of first reaction to that weekend finance ministry briefing being considered a disappointment for investors, Sherry. Yeah, we'll continue to watch the commodity space to see more of that reaction. Interesting that you mentioned that miners are actually gaining ground because we'll be watching metals, of course. We have seen iron ore futures really seeing that swing to the upside last week ahead of the China briefing. Bloomberg Industrial Metals Index also gained for a second session. But what will happen throughout the rest of the week, of course, is a key question given, of course, the disappointment over the lack of really a price tag when it comes to more stimulus measures coming from Beijing. Not to mention that we had already more data showing that China's deflationary problems are becoming pretty entrenched. Uh, we saw producer prices declining for 24 straight months. We are getting more Chinese data this week, trade data today, activity data, GDP data, of course, a little bit backwards looking, given that those numbers are coming from before for Beijing actually uh, made that turn uh, towards more pro-growth policies. But really, Heidi, we're looking at Brent crude as well, losing ground. Uh, we had seen some profit taking in the oils market. WTI is also around that $74 a barrel level. Despite the fact that we, of course, continue to watch Middle East tensions rising, Heidi, we are continuing to watch for any retaliation coming from Israel. We have seen Hezbollah now really continue their attacks against uh, northern Israel. But it's really the China picture right now that we'll be watching at the open. Of course, only in Seoul because Japan is away on holiday.
Yeah, and Sherry, I suppose the question is, even with the market disappointment over what was announced or what wasn't announced in specificity over the weekend, does it really kind of change the longer term expectations of whether Beijing policymakers are out there, whatever it takes moment, right? Because as we spoke with, you know, earlier guests, that reaction is really, well, we didn't get that number, but it doesn't mean that that firepower isn't still yet coming. And to be fair, the you know, bar for a, a, a good reaction from markets was pretty high. They wanted an announcement of a two trillion yuan or two hundred. 183 billion US dollar fiscal stimulus being announced and clearly this has been a letdown without um, those solid numbers but we're also of course getting more uh, policy powwows to come as well so that test for investors patience doesn't necessarily I guess in a sense uh, tell us what these new measures are going to be and how forceful they're going to be as well and we're still getting a bit of optimism Goldman for example raising its GDP forecast for China on account of the stimulus plans to shore up growth according to uh, this note out on October 13th 2024 real GDP up to 4.9%, uh, 2025 target uh, from 4.3% up to 4.7%. Interestingly, of course, both below that 5% official target. This is Bloomberg. This is the Asia Trade. We're counting down to Asia's major market opens. We do have breaking news just crossing the Bloomberg when it comes to uh, economic numbers out of Singapore that we're expecting. These GDP numbers are are going to uh, really give us an indication, Sherry, when it comes to how externally exposed this particular economy is. It's usually a good sort of, uh, you know, canary in the coal mine, if you will, indicator of how global trade headwinds or tailwinds might be progressing. We know that, you know, with so much uncertainty still uh, to be debated when it comes to the China recovery, a lot of these trade-reliant economies like Singapore and a lot of these Asian economies are really have a lot at stake here. So we'll be watching that very closely. Yeah, of course, we are getting those numbers out of Singapore right now. Third quarter GDP rising 2.1 percent quarter on quarter. The estimate was for 2 percent. So it's really a beat to the upside. Of course, we're also getting the Monetary Authority of Singapore coming out uh, right now. Heidi really talking about not changing their monetary stance at this point. So it's no change to the width, the center of the currency band as expected. Uh, the monetary policy settings are now still consistent according to the monetary authority but this all really uh, Heidi to do with uh, the broader outlook that we're really expecting central banks to move especially when it comes to either easing or hiking as it's the case here in Japan yeah that's right MA is saying that uh, the settings currently are consistent with median term price stability uh, that when it comes to the expansion of the economy that should continue at a steady pace but they have as expected maintaining the slope width and center of the currency band so really bucking the global easing trend keeping those policy bearings on hold officials of course using the strength of the currency to tackle uh, still pretty high levels of living costs there policymakers you know have been expected perhaps to strike more of a dovish tone to potentially pave the way for a change in that position next year when price pressures really do meaningfully abate. We didn't have uh, you know, many economists, in fact only three in the Bloomberg survey, seeing a change uh, and we did also have bigger than average options turnover uh, over the past few days suggesting that traders have been betting on a strengthening of the Singapore dollar as a result. So uh, we see the risk to the inflation outlook as being more balanced versus three months ago. That core CPI momentum is expected though to remain contained in the fourth quarter so perhaps some of that dovish is coming through and sherry uh, kind of laying the groundwork for a potential shift in policy next year yeah, according to Bloomberg Economics, the expectation is for easing in the month of January. But take a look at how we're coming online in the Asian session in South Korea. Again, a couple of markets closed across Asia. Japan, for example, Thailand also closed. Uh, we are watching the Japanese yen, though, holding steady against the U.S. dollars. We're seeing the Korean won also pretty steady. A little bit of weakness against the greenback at the moment. A little bit of divergence when it comes to the Kospi and the Kostak. But at least the Kospi gaining ground for six uh, tenths of 1% at the moment and really uh, 
trying to understand where the central bank here even in Korea is going uh, from now on, given that we heard from the BOK governor also last week talking about how their rate cut last week was a hawkish rate cut. So he actually had to spell it out for the markets as we're also trying to digest and understand where China goes from here, right? Let's bring in our next guest who says the lack of immediate clarity on China's efforts to reflate the economy is unlikely to be taken well by the markets. With us now is Chris Weston, head of research at Pepperstone Group. Chris, always great to have you with us. We continue to watch okay. those China exposed assets, China exposed stocks. Uh, what will you be watching for the biggest reaction? Well, we get the A50 futures opening at midday, or so 12 a.m. Uh, Eastern Daylight Time here in Australia. So, yeah, it's what, just just over just under an hour to go. So, obviously, that's going to be the first reaction. We've seen a little bit of selling in the in the offshore yuan, the CNH, this morning, but nothing too prolific at the moment. And of course, yeah, then we go into sort of the Hong Kong markets as well as as, as yeah, about quarter past 12, uh, an hour and a quarter's time from now. So, obviously, we're going to see the reaction. One suspects we're going to see a little bit of downside coming through there. Yeah, I think anyone sort of positioned for a you know some sort of defined plan about a, a, something that's going to stoke um, initial demand from the consumer. Obviously, there's going to be a little bit of disappointment. But, yeah, I think the consensus view that, that everyone's talking about on the floors this morning is that the, uh, maybe some short-term pain in Chinese equities. But, you know, this the plan that we've got here today or sort of on the weekend is certainly supportive of, of, of economics over the medium term. And therefore, there will be a level down, um, you know, 5% or so lower in Hong Kong and Chinese equities where we may see a bit of a tradable low coming through and people looking to, to take positions longer term. Of course, with the bond market, it's going to be the, the, the big one there. We did see a bit of selling in the 10-year, you know, when we saw the initial speculation last week and then people came in and bought that so if we were to see a sustained sell-off in in the 10-year or the five-year for example different parts of the curve then yeah you know, i think that would give us some clarity that people are seeing this is a bit more refresh refreshing exercise going forward so i think the equity market really wants to see higher and sustain higher trends coming through in the bond market to give us that clarity of the picture but yeah i think what we've heard is is a positive mm. longer term short term i think maybe see some downside here yeah, I was going to say, Chris, does this change the calculation at all that Beijing seems pretty intent in shoring up their economy? So when it comes to the markets, is this going to be a short term pullback and could we expect more upside in the months to come? Well, I think if, you, if you're looking at if you've got sort of a geographical mandate, um, then you know, China has changed. I think the investment case in China has changed now. A couple of months ago, people were saying it was an uninvestable market, but I think I think now it, it has a place. Obviously, you know, you're looking at the, your expected returns in China, and the difference between China, of course, than, than a lot of the Western markets, developed markets, is that the you know the distribution of outcomes in Chinese equities is is, is so prolific and so dispersed that you know, I can make a case now that, that we could see a 30% gain, 40% gain coming through in those markets. But you could also make a case that you could see a sort of 10, 15% downside over the next 12 months. So obviously that risk profile, um, that volatility, and we're seeing that, you know, the implied vol in, in the Hang Seng, for example, is still at 38% on one month out of the money. So yeah, that has a place, but obviously it comes with inherent risk. And so therefore, you know, you've got to look at that as, as part of the allocation. But I think given what the measures we've been seeing, I think it does change the game. Um, I think you know, the local governments have been one of the major problems with the disinflation, the deflationary spiral that we've been seeing. It's had such a dramatic impact on business confidence. And I think you know, what we've been seeing, the measures there to, to shore up local governments, to, 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 re, to take away some of the constraints, um, to buy back housing using special government bonds, um, it does free up a lot of the efficiencies in China and it will help reflate going forward. Of course, we need to see more information and we'll get that and hopefully we'll get that as we go into the next NPC meeting at the end of the month and then into the work economic conference at the end of the year. Um, but I think changing the game at a local government debt situation does remove some of the risks and, and will create reflation over time. It's not going to it's not going to be staggering. It's not going to be, you know, this, this two percentage point situation, but their views to increase the deficit, to use the deficit, to change the game in local government debt, I think it, it removes some of the downside risks and, and we're seeing you know, economic forecasts being revised up. So it comes, investing in China comes with risk, but I think you can make the case that it could be, you know, 30, 40 percent returns as opposed to some of the other Western markets if, if they get this right. Would you rather have direct exposure or would you be playing some of the proxies, um, like Australian assets, for example? Well, we're seeing some buying in material plays today. So, you know, obviously we're looking at that. But, yeah, I think, you know, I'd be looking directly at... Um, 
uh, you know, Chinese equities in the mainland, because that's where the liquidity is going to be coming from. You know, we've seen, obviously, the, the liquidity injections, companies allowed to buy back stock at 1.75%. So I'll be going for direct exposure, but my, my position sizing would be very small. I don't have that at the moment. But, you know, if we were to see some coming, uh, some, some growth coming through, and, and I think also after about a 13% earnings downgrade that we saw between July and into August, uh, you know, are we at the point where earnings in China are starting to trough and we might start seeing some, some upgrades? So I think that's where you're going to be getting the, the, the bigger bang for your buck. But again, it comes down to your risk profile in that situation as well. Of course, the other big concern that we do have and, and you know, the, the grey crowd hanging over China is, is the US election. Um, and, you know, obviously Trump, if he was to get in power and he is starting to find some some you know, some form at the moment, then obviously trade tariffs are something that, that could be passed without the blessing of Congress. And, and that is something that, that, that does pose a material risk for, for the Chinese efforts to reflate the economy and try and create animal spirits back in the, in the markets there. So, yeah, I think that, that's something, um, if they was to put a, a 35 percentage point uh, tariff increase in China, um, would, you know, really near term scuttle the, the situation. Of course, a lot of companies would have to look at changing their supply chains and, and they've already been doing that, I guess. But yeah, that, that is something that could cause a short term risk to, to the reflation efforts there. Where do you see euro dollar travelling from here? Because that's been quite interesting of late. Well, I mean, it's, there's, there's, there's quite a lot of bad news being priced in. I mean, we've seen a raft of ECB speakers talking about the downside risk to, to, to inflation. You're not getting that in the US, of course. You've got relative growth supporting the dollar. Um, you know, if you look at savings rates in Europe, they're around 15%. They're actually higher than where they were after the pandemic. Some of that can be drawn down, but I think that shows just how people are feeling in Europe, whereas the savings rates in the US is, is certainly um, yeah, around sort of 5%. Obviously, relative rate settings is, is very supportive of the US dollar. We're seeing that in both in, in real rates. But, you know, you go to SOFA and the, the, the trough rates is now sort of 3.3%. It's come up about 50, 60 basis points from the lows. And again, so relative rate, relative growth, savings rates, budgets in France, these factors are all you know, have been supportive of, of the dollar. Um, obviously, the Trump situation mm. comes in because they, there'll be tariffs there as mm -hmm. well. So I, I like euro dollar lower. I'll be selling rallies. I think all the signs are that the, the, the dollar's the place to be at the moment. Yeah, especially because we also continue to see more economic data that looks pretty resilient when it comes uh, to the US, right? What will you be watching in this earnings season? Well, the expected move, the implied move across sort of the average stocks is around 5.1%. So obviously people looking to sort of trade uh, the initial reaction and try and create, capture some volatility is, is, is going to be something there. Of course, you know, the AI thematic is one that's been lacking a catalyst of late. And are we going to see something as we go through the earnings season later in, in, in the month and into NVIDIA's numbers in November that, that reinvigorates that? I mean, we are seeing a bit of leadership again in NVIDIA and, and that's driving uh, markets, but it's the banks at the moment, which is really where the, the sort of the alpha is being driven in, in the S&P. Um, but yeah, I think uh, there's, there's good movement expected in the market. Yeah, earnings growth is, is, is sort of 4%. We expect that to be beaten. Um, and I think the bar this time around, you know, is quite low for, for companies to come out and beat. I think the markets, despite where we are in, the, in, in you know, all-time highs in the S&P and the Dow, is that, that you know, I think earnings expectations should be beaten very, very nicely. And again, that should just continue to propel us. And maybe we see a little bit of earnings upgrades coming through for the quarter. Um, uh, but I think the bar this time around is actually relatively low, despite where we are in this situation. And hedging risk is, uh, you know, people have put hedges in place, obviously, for the election, and uh, they'll, they'll stay in place. But, yeah, I think the equity market trades higher, um, mostly from a macro perspective. We've still got the Fed put really underpinning. Um, but I think earnings could play a bigger part and, and drive equities higher from here. Chris Weston, head of research at Pepperstone Group there. More ahead on the Asia trade. This is Bloomberg. China's highly anticipated finance ministry briefing on the weekend lacking the firepower that equity investors had hoped for. Beijing's promising more aid for the slumping property sector and indebted local governments. But economists are not convinced that it's enough to defeat deflation. Let's bring our China correspondent Min Lo and our chief North Asia correspondent Stephen Engel there in Hong Kong. So Min Min, let's start off with you. What did we hear from the finance ministry? 
Yes, so we didn't get that headline number in terms of the size of the fiscal budget deficit, but the Ministry of Finance did lay out a number of key measures, and that includes a one-off debt swap uh, for local governments, and that would... Uh, alleviate some of the pressure that local government face in repaying their debt and actually allow them to focus on investing in the economy to revive the economy. We don't know the size of that, but that's a measure that is coming. The other key measure is the issuance of special sovereign debt to recapitalize the big banks. Now, the banks still have very sufficient capital uh, right now, but this would also relieve some of the profit margin pressures that they are facing, especially after the PBOC had made calls for reductions to mortgage rates and also been slashing key policy rates as well. And the other key thing is the expansion of the use of local government special bonds. Those funds will now be allowed to help buy back unsold homes to be converted into social housing. They can be used to buy back idle land as well. So it could go some way to accelerate that home buyback program that we have seen a very low take-up rate so far this year. Um, another key thing, I think what is most disappointing uh, from this press briefing is the lack of specific measures that that are targeted at consumption. In terms of cash handout, the government said that they are going to double the amount of scholarships they give out to college graduates, for, for example, and increase the financial aid there. But it's nothing of the scale that investors have been hoping for. Also, some forward guidance for next year. The Minister of Finance saying that there is still a relatively large room to expand a fiscal deficit. So, Steve, does all of this mean that we can expect just more market turmoil? What are analysts saying? Yeah, absolutely, because we saw on Friday, of course, the CSI 300 uh, capping its biggest weekly loss since late July. This after, of course, that big rally. And, of course, it kind of, uh, you know, sends out the warning signs as this another Chinese false dawn uh, for stocks. Uh, on top of it, we had weak uh, inflation data. CPI came in less than expected and also producer factory gate uh, deflation uh, persisting now for 24 consecutive months, two straight years. So there's an overall negative sentiment. And there's Min Min just said there was no specific stimulus outlined for consumption. And again, analyst community, at least the, those uh, it, uh, surveyed by Bloomberg News, expected uh, at least some sort of stimulus package in the tune of 2 trillion yuan, 283 billion U.S. dollars. But the finance minister did not outline a specific number, only saying uh, that uh, they have room for further stimulus. And the People's Daily, by the way, yesterday came out with a full-page article, sort of a... A a, uh, a a plea to you must trust us, and I'm paraphrasing because it's basically saying uh, that as long as we have firm confidence and precisely implement policies, we will definitely be able to continue the long-term positive trend of China's economic development. So they're they're asking investors to kind of play the long game uh, when, of course, there is so much short-term uh, volatility and speculation right now. But even consumers in China themselves are not buying this, right? I mean, I mean Steve also uh, talked to the deflationary pressure that we're seeing in that economy. How big of a risk is that? Yeah, as he mentioned, we have been seeing very weak inflation numbers out there. But I have to say that 2 trillion yuan that investors were expecting, that is still on the table, though, because remember, we were talking about how any revision to the budget deficit, as well as any new bond issuance above this year's quota, that still has to be approved by the legislature. So we might only hear an actual scale, that number that we're looking for, that could come out after the National People's Congress Standing Committee meets sometime in late October. And by the way, some economists are saying that even though we're not hearing the scale of any additional new special bonds, uh, the existing bonds, 2.3 trillion yuan that are still unused, plus the widening of usage of existing bonds, that could unleash plenty of idle funds because one of the reasons that fiscal spending has been slow is because of a lack of suitable projects to invest in. Infrastructure investment has been extremely saturated, so loosening the restrictions around what those bonds funds can be used for could inject more liquidity liquidity and more investment into the economy as well. And Goldman Sachs, by the way, also revised up China's GDP growth forecast from 4.7% to 4.9% for this year. At the same time, Steve, the activity data, the sort of data dump that we're getting this week is really just going to reinforce some of these concerns. 
Yeah, I think so. On Friday, of course, we're going to get that third quarter GDP number. Uh, the consensus is for 4.5% growth. This after the second quarter, 4.7%. Uh, so it's heading in the wrong direction if China is determined to, again, hit that uh, target of full-year growth of around 5%, so 4.5%. Again, the weakness is what we've seen in property and in consumption. And again, these ongoing crackdowns that we have seen in property, uh, in uh, consumer technology, and now more recently, the financial sector, of course, which uh, state media has blamed for promoting a hedonistic lifestyle. Uh, that's why maybe we'll get uh, some signals from another press conference that officials are going to be given later today. But if you look at the lineup at 10 o'clock this morning of who's going to be attending that, it's a, a state council information office press conference. But who's attending? The, state the director of the state administration for market regulation, the vice minister of the minister of industry and information technology, the vice minister of the ministry of justice, that's telling, and also the deputy director of state financial supervision of administration and administration bureau. So I think this is going to focus a lot on uh, some of the discipline uh, that uh, the regulators and the Communist Party obviously wants to instill in the financial sector after that rally, and then, of course, the bit of a fizzling out on the stock market. <laughs> Yeah, we'll be watching those comments very closely. Our chief North Asia correspondent, Stephen Engel, and our China correspondent, Mi Minlo. And you can also turn to your Bloomberg for more on China's market reaction when trading begins in the next hour. Go to TLIVGO to get commentary and analysis from Bloomberg's export editors. Welcome back. U.S. earnings season is underway, and Wells Fargo is downplaying the impact of rate cuts on results. The bank on Friday posted third quarter profit that topped analysts' expectations as a surge in investment banking fees helped counter a dip in lending revenue. CFO Michael Santomassimo told us they're expecting deposits to drive near-term performance. Rates are still quite high on a relative basis over the, from the last few years. The last few years, and so you are still seeing repricing happen on the asset side. Um, but in the near term, what really drive what really drive where we end up over the next couple quarters is the deposit side, and we've seen some good uh, trends there now over the last couple quarters, where you've seen this this cash sorting and the mixed different mix changes really moderate. Uh, it's, it was the slowest uh, quarter, where, you know, so far since uh, over the last couple of years, you know, for that uh, in the portfolio. Um, and, and we've been able to adjust pricing as, uh, just as we thought we would as the rates came down. So that'll be the, that'll be the factor that really drives near-term performance. So, uh, Mike, it's good to chat with you. Uh, to that point, then, does that mean that the move into higher yielding, say, CDs or money market funds, et cetera, like that's definitely done as rates cuts come down? Well, I wouldn't say it's it's necessarily done, but but I think we saw the lowest migrate lowest pace of migration since uh, rates started increasing, uh, Alex. And so I think you know that's a good trend. And I think eventually what you do what you see generally or expect to see generally is that, you know, what's left in checking accounts ends up being operating cash for a lot of people. So right. a lot of that shifting into other other uh, alternatives has happened already. Yeah, my high yield savings account already coming down there. All right, uh, let's get to the loan part of your portfolio. When do you think you see a really big uptick in loan growth? What's going to be that catalyst? Yeah, it's really hard to say exactly, right? And and I think when you look at what's what we're hearing from clients and what you're seeing, you know, rates coming down helpful, right? Because borrowing costs come down. I think there's still some uncertainty related to the election that's coming up. And then I think people want to see this base case kind of soft landing economic scenario play out a little bit longer. And then I think a combination of those things will start to build confidence. Um, and then I think you may start to see people be either build inventories or, or make additional capital expenditures that, they, that they've been holding off on now for a little bit. But I don't think it's just one thing. I think you really need to see a you know, confluence of these things come together. And so it could take a little bit of time. Uh, for that to really materialize uh, in borrowing. With regards to that client activity, Mike, and, and the election, and the idea that once we get past that, maybe we see more activity, is that irrespective of who wins, or are they trying to hedge their bets? Well, you know, I think I think uh, you know what people don't like is uncertainty, Romaine, and and so I think once there's some certainty of the path, 
um, and you you know you feel like that economic you know outlook is going to play out the way they think. I think those things are going to what, what really matter. Uh, and then assuming rates continue to come down and reduce borrowing costs, so I, I really do think it's going to be a combination of all those things. But it's the it's the it's the uncertainty part that I think causes people to hold off. Wells Fargo CFO Mike Santamassimo, they're speaking with Bloomberg's Alex Steele and Romain Bostic. Take a look at our futures in Europe are opening at the moment as we continue to get really that reaction to uh, the disappointment over China and the Ministry of Finance briefing and the lack of uh, details and specific numbers when it comes to fiscal stimulus. Uh, commitment. Uh, we're already seeing that wariness play out across Asian markets, certainly across FX being expressed through the likes of uh, the Aussie as well as the Yuan. But Euro Stock 50 futures looking like we'll open. It's looking pretty flat at the moment there. Uh, we do have German DAX futures looking a little bit more positive at the moment. We have had, of course, a number of gains when it comes to luxury as well as miners. Uh, they lagged actually in the Friday sector, so we'll be watching those keenly in the European Open. We take you to the Lion City, where Singapore's central bank has kept its monetary settings unchanged, saying its current stance is consistent with medium-term price stability, maintaining the slope width and center of the currency band as core CPI momentum has been staying contained in the fourth quarter. We also got GDP numbers growing 2.1 percent in the last quarter on a rebound in manufacturing, Heidi. Cherry, just weeks out from the U.S. election, officials in Taipei are focused on what the November vote will mean for the island. Bloomberg's Annabelle Jewellers spoke to Taiwan's tech minister about which new administration is likely to better serve the local chip industry. So, what do we hear? Well, it was, a, of course, a big focus of the interview as well. I mean, Taiwan as an island really depends on that relationship between the U.S. and China and the, the tech rivalry between the two major powers. And so that was sort of a key focus, whether it would be President Trump coming into the White House, President Harris, which one would be better for the semiconductor industry? And I posed that question to Taiwan's tech minister. Take a listen. I don't worry about whether uh, the, the Republic or the Democratic parties. That I believe they, they will all agree on continue, continuing uh, the same direction. Uh, I, I don't worry too much about that. Do you see that putting further pressure then on Taiwanese companies to expand production facilities in the U.S.? Well, it's an issue. Uh, I, I believe, yes. But uh, in short term, maybe it's pain, painful for, for the Taiwanese companies because it's more expensive, actually, if they move over there. But in the long run, maybe it's good for them, from my point of view because they, they can improve themselves. I do want to talk about the other areas for, for cooperation between the U.S. and Taiwan, and drones has been highlighted as a particular area. Drones, yes. Where would you look to, to, to partner? We are working on, on a model that uh, maybe we can establish a, a local supply chain here in Taiwan from chips to, to other components and, and to the modules to system. And we, we would like to work with the U.S. based on the innovative systems that have been developed in the U.S. because in the past we don't have the, this kind of industry. China has really established a lead in the drone market for a variety of different uses. Right, we know that. How long is it going to take for Taiwan to catch up and can it catch up, do you think? That is why uh, we, we are working on this, this project now. We, 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 don't, we don't want to use drones from China anymore in the future. Our intention is to uh, gradually replace all the components from China. And as a matter of fact, most of the uh, components may be made by Taiwanese companies in China. Uh, today, but uh, in the future we would like to invite them to come, come home. Returning to semiconductors for a moment, but speaking about China, people will talk about the, the technological advancements that China is making in, in its chip technology. 
Others would say, actually, you need to think about how far is China behind TSMC? And that really gives you the true indication. When we talk about the most advanced technology, I think China is be quite behind quite a lot. But if, if we're talking about mature technologies, they are not behind. How many years then are we talking about? When, when we talk about, talk about the most advanced manufacturing technologies, which is uh, two nanometer, silicon technology, CMOS technology, I openly say that more than 10 years. You mean it takes a full decade to, to catch up, or you think that it can be done sooner? Not, not any sooner. Impossible. So some comments there around how much China is behind in Taiwan when it comes to producing the most advanced semiconductor technology really seen perhaps that this is sort of an unassailable lead that Taiwan has in this space but of course it's that key question around that pressure that Taiwanese companies are seeing to expand here that push from the US in particular to onshore or reshore some of that technology as well and that pressure does not seem to be going away regardless of the administration that enters the White House. Our tech reporter Annabel Druller is there and we stay with tech and the earnings season underway across Asia. Infosys, Wipro and HCL technologies are up against high expectations for the earnings reports as investors increasingly fret over a potential market correction in India. For more, Bloomberg earnings specialist Rena Sazaki joins us now. And Rena, what can we expect from India's IT sector? Yes, so we're expecting the IT, uh, India IT sector and the firms uh, such as uh, uh, Infosys, uh, Wipro and ACT's uh, to Q margins and revenues to grow uh, in the result uh, that's coming on Thursday. And uh, the emphasis is uh, rightly expected to raise its full year forecast as a 2025 has been seen as a year of recovery thanks to the, uh, the U.S. rates uh, down cycle. Um, so we are watching out for any commentaries on the new opportunities and projects in generative AI as uh, the, the we saw the clients earn uh, spending more on uh, such a space uh, as we saw in uh, the TCS's uh, uh, results last week. What are we expecting in terms of the market reaction? Yes, so all eyes are on um, whether the companies can uh, meet the high expectations um, as they, uh, the market is increasingly, uh, investors are increasingly fret over the market corrections. Um, as India has been a bull market for the last, uh, uh, for the past few, several months uh, and then hitting the new records and uh, the company would have to show such high valuations are uh, justifiable in their results. Bloomberg News earnings reporter Rena Sasaki here with the latest on what to expect in India. Of course, we have seen that market pressure in the Indian stocks already for the last two weeks. We continue to see those outflows uh, this month. We saw it at around $6 billion. Uh, the Indian rupee has at one point fallen past that 84 to a dollar. But that, of course, also to do with the strength of the U.S. dollar as well. Really, those two weeks of gains by the U.S. dollar sending pressure across Asia. The Japanese yen holding at that 149 level. We do have Japanese markets away on holidays today, so we don't have equity trading, but we'll be looking forward to trading at the China market opens. We are seeing already the downside pressure on the offshore yuan still at around that seven per dollar level, Heidi, but all to do, of course, with the lack of details when it came to that stimulus announcement from the finance ministry over the weekend. And we're seeing that similar downside pressure, Sherry, when it comes to that other China proxy that we watch, which is the Aussie dollar, right? That sort of doubling down of both dollar strength and uh, some concerns over the disappointment over the weekend, sending the Aussie dollar a little bit weaker today. We are seeing, though, some strength when it comes to Aussie equities, up about three tenths of one percent trading at the highest in about two weeks at this point. Uh, we are seeing financials following the US banks a little bit higher, and also, interestingly, materials and metals, including the iron ore miners, also 
leading gains despite iron ore itself. Futures trading in Singapore actually lagging and showing that disappointment uh, in the China story there as well. We're also seeing in terms of what we're seeing with uh, with bonds, Australian and New Zealand yields both rising. They're playing catch up with US peers as well, which of course rose on Friday after the higher than expected uh, core PPI numbers uh, from the US. We're also lo looking ahead to uh, some of the further banks' uh, earnings this week and how that's going to play out in this part of the world as well. Uh, one stock that we are watching though is Web Travel Group. They have seen a huge move to the downside, tumbling as much as 33% and pretty close to that at the moment. It really cratering on these concerns over margin erosion, investors really punishing that share price today. The company reiterated some of the neg negative impacts on its Webbed's total transaction value revenue margins. It was first noted at the AGM in uh, at the end of August. We also know that last month Web Travel spun off its online travel agency business Webjet Group, uh, which began trading as an independent entity and then are focused on uh, the Webbed's business, which is uh, a platform that connects hotels and other travel service providers to travellers across the globe. They're saying that that first half preliminary TTD revenue margins are now expected to be about 6.4% down from 7% as indicated back in August. have been impacted by uh, factors including the collapse of FDI Group, the Paris Olympics and the European Football Championship as well. So European margins in particular have remained quite subdued. They are still in line when it comes to what they see for expenses and uh, the commitment of that full year TTV by full year uh, 2030 as well and that 50% EBITDA margin target but still that is really one stock that is being punished today. More ahead on the Asia trade, this is Bloomberg. Take a look at frontier markets. Vietnam has been outperforming regional peers of late. The stock market there recording double digit gains in three of the past five years. Our next guest manages Vietnam Enterprise Investments Limited. It's one of the country's largest fund managers with over $6 billion in assets. The fund is up over 6% this year. Pao Thang No is the portfolio manager at Dragon Capital. It's really great to have you in person in Sydney. Um, you're here for the investment conference. So, what does that tell us about the level of interest in Vietnam? at the moment from foreign investors? Um, I think the Vietnam uh, macro outlook is uh, has um, our optimistic uh, with our GDP growth number for the first nine months is 7.4 percent and we predict the whole year number will around 6.8 percent. I think the market outlook is also more optimistic thanks to firstly the interest rate environment in Vietnam has been under a favorable condition. Our uh, State Bank of Vietnam already cut the rate by 150 uh, basic points last year and currently with the Fed decision to cut rate, the State Bank of Vietnam uh, would like to maintain a favorable interest rate and it would benefit for the stock market investment and uh, property investment. Uh, the interest of the foreign investor in Vietnam recently I think uh, resumed uh, coming back. Recently we received more requests for the meeting um, for the investment opportunity in Vietnam. Uh, the market valuation uh, is still are uh, reasonable with the price to uh, book up one times and the price to earning of 6.5 times with the earning growth projected uh, 16 to 18 percent this year and next year. Where do you see the sector opportunities? Uh, we uh, currently focus on the three key investment themes that would benefit from the Vietnam economic growth, which is uh, the middle class formation, the infrastructure development and also urbanization, which representing all the three key sectors. Firstly is the banking sector, uh, which is the biggest sector in our portfolio with 37% of our AUM in there. We focus on the top private bank in Vietnam, who is the pioneer in the digitalization and also the mass market segment. Uh, for example, Vietnam Prosperity Bank and also Asia Commercial Bank. The earning growth for the banking sectors uh, is forecasted around 18 to 20 percent this year thanks to the strong credit growth and also improving in the asset quality. Uh, the valuation of the banking sector is also attractive at the price to book up one times and price to earning up 6.5 times. The second uh, 
investment opportunity that we have a high conviction in our portfolio is the retail sector. Uh, this sector has been benefiting from the rising middle class formation in Vietnam and also there is a shifting in uh, from the traditional market to the modern trade and could benefit for the private company who could provide a modern platform for the uh, consumer and they could uh, gain the market share uh, from the, tradi the traditional mom and pop shop to become a new uh, leader in so, these sectors. Uh, I, our top um, so it, investment in this segment is um, Mobile World, the biggest retail in the country, who is the champion in uh, the ICT and electronic consumption and recently grocery market. And another company is FPT Retail, who is leading in pharmacy sector. Uh, the final um, sector like that we I would like to mention is the uh, yes, technology and also IT. Um, the FPT is the leading IT service in this sector and they could deliver a sustainable earning growth of 20% for this year and next year. Okay, so tell, um, let's talk a little bit about uh, perhaps some of the risks that we should also take look, a look at when it comes to the Vietnamese market. I mean, everything seems pretty positive, growth is pretty strong, trade is pretty strong. Uh, but what are some of the factors that investors should be watching, especially when geopolitics uh, it's so volatile at the moment, and we don't exactly know how the U.S. presidential elections are going to go. Mm. Uh, thanks, uh, Sherry, for the question. Uh, I think the risk of um, uh, for the Vietnam uh, growth is now more on the external factors than the internal ones, um, especially the um, U.S. election result in this um, uh, November. Uh, so if the uh, Republicans uh, win and they uh, focus on the protectness of the trade policy, uh, like they could impose a 60% tariff for China and 10% for other countries, especially for those countries have a, a high trade surplus with, with them, and Vietnam is one of those. So if uh, this happens, it could impact to the Vietnam uh, export growth in short term. Uh, however, um, I think that Vietnam already experienced the same situation um, in the past, especially in the period of 2018, 2020, and we have um, overcome this difficult uh, quite well. So in medium and long term, uh, we don't think it's a big issue for Vietnam. There are some concerns about where Vietnam goes next because obviously it, it's a very attractive uh, tech supplier hub at the moment, right? Do you see the process of skills upgrading, infrastructure upgrading so that they can reach kind of the next level and not just be a supplier to the likes of Apple, for example? Mm, mm. Uh, I think the um, human uh, resources in Vietnam has improved their uh, productivity and also their um, capability uh, working in the, the tech um, uh, 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 area. Uh, for example, like FPT is our key representative in the technique, um, IT and uh, technical area. They have their education business, which is they uh, train the student uh, with the um, high quality standard, international standard, to provide for the technology sector and also work for, for FPT themselves. And the uh, private education in Vietnam has grown uh, at a quite high rate and the numbers of students who come overseas and uh, come back to work for the country is also as a uh, significant number. Thao, really great to have you with us. Thao Thang Ngo, who's the Portfolio Manager at Dragon Capital. You can catch up uh, on our programming live and see past interviews on our interactive TV function. That's at TV Go. You can also dive into any of the securities or the Bloomberg functions we talk about. Join in on the conversation as well. You can send us instant messages during our shows. This is for Bloomberg subscribers only. Do check it out. It's at TV Go. This is Bloomberg. And these are the latest from the corporate front. Hong Kong's biggest real estate developer, Sang Hong Kai Properties, says it has sold all 238 units at its Cullinan Sky project. 
units in the development in Hong Kong's Kai Tak district sold for an average of more than 2,900 US dollars per square foot. The market is keenly watching apartment sales in Hong Kong. For signs, rate cuts might help ease the city's property slump. The collective of charities that indirectly controls India's $165 billion Tata Group has appointed Noel Tata as its new chairman. Tata Trusts says the decision was unanimous and effective immediately. 67-year-old Noel is the half-brother of former chair Ratan Tata, who died last week. He currently heads the group's fast uh, fashion retailer Trent and also aircon maker Voltas. Chinese EV maker BYD is working on its strategy to woo European buyers. Executive Vice President Stella Lee told the newspaper the company may initially offer electric vehicles in Germany for about $27,000 to $32,000. The plan comes after the EU this month voted to impose tariffs of as much as 45% on EVs from China. Sherry, take a look at how we're setting up when it comes to uh, markets that are coming online a little bit later today and, of course, keenly, keenly watching for the reaction when it comes to uh, how Chinese equities, both offshore and onshore, are going to track this sort of disappointment theme that we've been seeing already. The lack of dis really details from uh, the Ministry of Finance in the briefing over the weekend. We could see some of that consolidation going into the China Open as well. We've already seen that being expressed, uh, for example, through the likes of proxies like the Aussie dollar, the weakness in the yuan as well. Some of those downside risks also being expressed through uh, materials pricing, iron ore uh, taking a dip as well. But we are seeing S&P futures looking pretty flat at the moment. Uh, TIAX futures up actually by about uh, three tenths of one percent there. And A50 China futures actually uh, had traded positive. That's the last trade number that we're looking at. But certainly the test is going to be, you know, how this disappointment is played out today, given that we have seen really those sky high high expectations not being met, even though I suppose there were very few that actually did expect a, a dollar figure or a yuan figure to be put on the amount of fiscal stimulus that would be pledged. But more support was pledged, particularly when it comes to be the struggling property sector. There were hints at more government borrowing to shore up the economy more broadly. But Sherry, we also know that going into this week, we're going to be getting a lot more data from China on the economy, and none of it is going to point to much optimism of a rebound at this point. Yeah, China trade data, not to mention, of course, activity data and GDP data, a little bit backward looking given that all of these numbers are from before uh, that uh, stimulus package really was released by China late September, right? But the, we did see really that impact when it comes to the broader markets and really growth expectations also rising from uh, economists when it comes to China. Goldman Sachs still expecting that 4.9 percent to be achieved this year although Beijing wants that 5% growth target. Of course, we have seen markets also, despite the disappointment last week, with its biggest weekly loss since late July for the CSI 300, that were still up more than 20% since late September when the PBOC announced this broad package of measures that included an interest rate cut. So if you look at valuations as well, you can see that uh, when it comes to China, yes, it's gone up, but we're still way below, say, India or Taiwan at the moment. So that's potentially one thing that investors will be weighing when they decide whether or not they want to jump into the Chinese markets again as we now continue to see <laughs> this FOMO expand, given that when could we see more stimulus measures, right? I mean, is this the end of it because we didn't get it from the finance ministry? Or, Heidi, should we be looking at the National People's Congress in a few weeks as well? Chinese markets are interesting again, Sherry. I'm thankful for that. But certainly, as you point out, there's the FOMO camp and there's the, you know, this is another false dawn camp. And it's quite interesting looking at the data in terms of what history will show us because the track record for these sorts of Chinese equity rallies are actually pretty mixed. It best indicators suggest that perhaps we'll see a little bit of further upside, but that those gains will be more moderated. History suggests that that pace of the increase could be more measured. It's certainly what we saw over the weekend kind of reinforces that likelihood uh, that, you know, the sort of anemic gains might be seen going forward there. That's it for the Asia trade. Our markets coverage continues next.